Good morning, Ultimatum Waiting Room. I'm coming to you to just drop another build into the mix of potential starters out there. Don't worry though, mine is probably worse than most uh, because I'm choosing a skill that I really like but most people don't seem to, which is Sunder. Uh, I quite enjoyed playing Sunder a bit last league, but I didn't quite get the build to where I wanted it to because I had a couple of unfortunate rips, one to my ISP taking a dump, another one to a game crash, and uh, so I wanted to take it to the max a little bit more, and I did experiment with kind of restarting fresh with it to see if it would be a good league starter, and it did feel very, very good, even on a five link starting to push some endgame stuff. So with that said, let's jump into a couple of the key points here. This isn't going to be an extremely detailed guide. I'm just kind of laying out some of the, the key points um, and there is some flexibility uh, with respect to some of the more minute details of the build. Another thing I'll point out, this will be on SSF Hardcore. If you wanted to do this in Softcore, you could, but there are certainly faster builds. But of course, you could also make this deal quite a bit more damage if you sacrifice some of the defense for some additional damage. As well, if you're in Trade League, you'll be able to get quite a bit better gear and just note that I am very conservative with the boxes I tick on uh, uh, Path of Building, um, so it does probably quite a bit more damage than it says here, and there's also some elements of the way that the build works that make it difficult to accurately reflect in the tooltip DPS. Um, but I would say you can get many times this damage quite easily, uh, especially if you can kill bosses within a couple of flask rotations and stuff like that, which you quite often will be able to, I'm sure, especially with trade league gear. So with that said, let's point out the keystones on the build first. Resolute technique, kind of a given with most slam builds. Yes, we will be, in a lot of ways, kind of a traditional slam build, but there are some key differences. Anyway, going in hardcore with a slam build, use RT, lets you spec more defense. Um, very, very efficient node. We're going to be using the Impaler Keystone. This is kind of the build-defining keystone in a way, uh, because the way Sunder works, when the main uh, sort of fissure in the ground hits enemies, it creates smaller shockwaves that hit nearby enemies. So what ends up happening is, with the Impaler Keystone, it hits them, with that first really big hit that's been juiced up by all your exerts and everything, all the impale stacks get applied up front. So even though you're attacking slow, what ends up happening is the shock waves from the nearby enemies all trigger those impale stacks. So you get a lot of burst in situations where there's multiple enemies on the screen. So it feels really good even uh, as you start pushing deep into delirium and stuff like that and stuff gets pretty tanky. Um, because of the because of this interaction, you get a lot of upfront burst damage, and it feels quite good. Eventually, we'll want to be using Chainbreaker. I think this build will be fine, even with the changes to Chainbreaker coming uh, in this patch. In fact, it might even be better because now you only lose rage once per attack, uh, whereas before, what would end up happening is it's every time you hit an enemy, and so because a single Sunder can last more than 0.3 seconds, it actually might uh, cause you to lose rage more than once from a single Fissure. So anyway, it might actually end up being a little bit better. It's a little hard to say though, because now you will be losing rage when you Warcry and stuff as well. You can take Veil Pact, um, Veil Pact is a total, totally reasonable take, especially because I plan on using the Writhing Jar, which will make it, uh, you know, not that unsafe to rely on Leech for your recovery. But I feel like because I'm using Enduring Cry, and because I get a lot of incidental regen on the tree, uh, it's probably not quite worth it to do that and it'll also make us a little bit more resilient to the different map mods. So for example, we could probably still do a map that says you cannot leech from enemies. I likely won't, um, just to play it safe. But anyway, all that aside, uh, I like sort of 
taking advantage of the burst regen from Enduring Cry, but this is totally reasonable and I may end up experimenting with it and deciding that I do like it. Um, I just never really got to that point. I had trouble dropping a writhing jar. Um, I might even try and use Ancient Orbs to, to get one a little sooner because it is a pretty important piece in this build for a little extra safety. Um, finally, we take Wind Dancer just because we're right there and in boss situations, uh, Wind Dancer will actually give us a, a nice bit of a health buffer against really big hits from kind of slammy type attacks. We can likely uh, uh, live through a lot of various slam attacks using this as well. Um, we get a little bit of incidental percent increased evasion from all the decks we have, and then we're going to be running a Jade Flask right here, um, which can take advantage of the big evasion boost that you get in mapping situations. Uh, if you've been hit recently. So it's actually a keystone that helps both bossing and general mapping um, in our particular setup. So pretty darn good. Uh, we're using endurance charges, armor, and some fortify scaling as a way of uh, giving our build some extra tankiness. Um, the Lethal Pride that we're using to get Chainbreaker, hopefully we get some increased Fortify effect on some of these nodes in here. And so those will be the primary ways that we scale it. We may end up specking into this wheel as well if we get some additional Fortify effect on our gear and we get a really good Lethal Pride. It'll make this even more valuable because the more you have, the more powerful it gets. And so uh, we might lean into that a little bit harder if we need to. Um, ailment immunity is another one of the key uh, defensive pieces we're getting because of one of the nerfs that happened in this particular patch. You can no longer anoint crystal skin and then do three crafts on your chest, your helm, and your gloves to get ailment immunity. And so now we're leaning into this to get our ailment immunity. We still might even spec crystal skin at some point because it'll just make it that much easier to get. I don't have to get perfect rolls. Uh, for ailment immunity if I have crystal skin spec and it does give max res so it's still not a bad choice. The anoint we did choose for the moment is martial experience gives decent damage overwhelm is relevant later uh, once map mods start coming into play and the increased recovery per second from life leech between the 100% here and the 100% you get on these two points allows you to stack up your leech stacks uh, in like a bossing scenario or something more easily. And so I do think that that is uh, a, a pretty relevant stat. It's also cheap and accessible, but there are, is a lot of flexibility in terms of anoints. You could take Tenacity, um, you could take Admonisher, and then Respec here within the Ascendancy um, and use Admonisher to clear bleeds You'll have to figure out stun immunity some other way, but with the new uh, buffed Abyss Jewels and Essence Craft for stun avoidance, it's very doable. Um, so you have some options there. Uh, in terms of what's boosting our damage, I mean, our multipliers are increased damage taken from uh, Flesh and Stone, more increased damage taken from Pride, uh, we run Blood and Sand, we run, you know, Max Chance to Impale, Dread Banner, we get Seismic Cry, we get Intimidating Cry, so all the typical stuff that you get with uh, Slam builds. As well, it's worth noting that because of the snapshotting of the Impaler, we do use uh, Phase Run. Um, phase Run is pretty darn powerful if you can you know, have a way of prolonging the duration, or in our case, of snapshotting the damage, which is what we're doing. And uh, we'll probably be self-casting vulnerability just on bosses and stuff like that. Um, so also worth noting that Pride does require a decent amount of investment before you can run it. Herald of Purity is actually a pretty good replacement leading up to that. I've, I've done it, that's what I was doing, even on my five link setup, and it still felt pretty decent, like I said, into kind of early end game. Um, so 
uh, Herald of Purity is totally reasonable and actually feels kind of good because also the minions summoned by Herald of Purity proc the Impaler stacks, um, or your Impale stacks that get applied by the Impaler. And so it kind of gives you a little bit more like pseudo burst uh, in your early mapping, which feels pretty good. So these are kind of the key tenants of the build um, on gear. Most of my stuff doesn't really have anything but like life and resists. And I even, you know, I threw the, the key crafts and things on there. Um, some armor is good as well. But, you know, in terms of major mods to look out for, eventually you want to start getting some mana regen so that with Chainbreaker, you have better uptime on Berserk. Uh, this pride has reduced mana reservation is something that you'll want to want to find if possible uh, on a Warlord amulet. So that'll make it a little hard to get a Blue Pearl amulet. Um, but you know you can start. You can use Harvest and and uh, I believe there's a Beast, uh, new Beast craft that'll help you do that. So it's not completely impossible even in an SSF environment. Um, that's really only the only kind of like big crafts you want to be super concerned about. If you can get Fortify effect on Helmet and Amulet, that's pretty awesome. Um, but I think this build will be safe enough anyway. Uh, if you play competently. In terms of uh, flasks, we run both a granite and a jade flask. The jade flask, for the reason I mentioned earlier, granite, because we're leaning into uh, molten shell and veil molten shell heavily, and lion's roar is just disgusting on uh, melee setups, especially ours, because we can kind of snapshot the damage with the impaler keystone. Um, phasing is just too important on a setup like this. I've died numerous times without phasing in my sort of PoE history um, because I hit enemies and kind of got caught off guard being unable to move when I thought I'd be able to move. So super important. Writhing Jar, again, helps keep Fortify and Leech going. Um, and then a Quicksilver Flask because you will be using movement speed as one of your primary means of mobility. In terms of the skill rollout, here are the supports for Sunder that I'm going to run. You don't have to run Pulverize, but I think it's super good. Again, works really well with the Impaler Keystone. All the others are somewhat mandatory, um, but if you wanted a little more attack speed, then you could skip Pulverize, but I think it's pretty important on this setup. The War Cries, the three War Cries, Second Wind, we use Dash for our movement skill. You can use um, Smoke Mine or something like that if that's your preference. But this is what I like using, and we get a lot of decks on the tree uh, because we're pathing over to the Ailment Avoidance nodes, and so all that decks makes Dash feel significantly better. Um, Berserk for when we get Chain Breaker, and then Flesh and Stone with Mame. Pride, kind of standard again. You can swap Herald of Purity in here for quite a while if you need to. Um, Enlighten may not be realistic, but hopefully we get one eventually. Molten Shell with increased duration and Second Wind to just improve the uptime on it. Notice that also on the tree, we are specced into this wheel right here, so we're leaning pretty heavily into Molten Shell to do a lot of work. Um, I figure that if we don't die to upfront burst, then we're probably not going to die with all the sustain we have. And so I actually self-cast Molten Shell. Also in this build, Totems are not very good. It has a poor interaction with the Impaler. And thus, um, we will be running Veil Molten Shell and have, I think, quite good uptime with it. And Veil skills just kind of got buffed. This one didn't in particular, but just the, um, the, the way that you gain souls was improved. And so uh, that should help Veil Molten Shell you know, just sort of indirectly, even if it didn't get a direct buff itself. Phase run again for that sort of snapshotting effect. Dread Banner, Blood and Sand uh, to round out our mana reservation skills. Um, Blood Rage, Blood Rage is just really good. Vulnerability, like I said, self-casting um, against bosses and stuff should be completely viable because you're oh, most of the time you're actually going to be waiting for your Fist of War procs or you're going to get Fist of War procs like every other hit. Um, with the way that this build is set up. So self-casting this doesn't actually 
uh, hurt your, your DPS uptime very much at all. So those are sort of the key tenets of the build. There is some flexibility on this passive tree. I'm showing you just sort of one hypothetical tree. Um, but if, if you notice right now, it's showing quite a bit of unreserved mana. Some of that is because POB is not updated yet to reflect the change to, um, to the flesh and stone reserving additional mana, but we'd still have more than enough. And so you could probably get away with unspecking this wheel invest in some more defense or some more offense. Um, but for right now, I have this spec to help make sure that I can run Pride a little bit sooner. Um, in fact, I think I could probably run it even without the uh, the mod on that amulet. But that would give some additional, uh, you know, sort of an additional buffer zone and would prevent me from having to craft minus mana cost of th skills on all three of my pieces of jewelry, um, I could get away with only doing it on two and then running the additional leech mod. Though I still might just say, I'll sacrifice that tiny bit of damage and uh, instead get sort of the, the flexibility of uh, having basically free skills. You could even get reduced mana cost of skills on, on some jewels. Um, to, to help push you toward that that zero cost set of skills. And, you know, there's a lot of value in that in and of itself. And then this this wheel becomes less important. But it does have some decent damage in AoE, so it's not the worst. Um, but anyway, there is some flexibility. You could potentially go into this wheel. Like I said, you can spec here if you get more Fort Effect, and that becomes more powerful. You can spec into this if you get the Warcry buff effect somewhere else. It's kind of a rare mod. But like on a Crusader Karui Chopper, which is what I might be going for, that or a Warlord, um, you know, you actually get a pretty decent boost to, you hit that critical threshold on Enduring Cry, where you now get plus 3% Fizz Resistance per charge, as opposed to plus 2. Um, and, you know, you boost your Overwhelm and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's not the worst to spec into this, and Debilitate is certainly decent um, and has okay uptime in this setup. So it's so close to being a really good node, so close, uh, but I think it is okay in this setup and potentially worth taking. So there's definitely some flexibility there. You can take this, um, but those are kind of the general principles of the build. Uh, I wanna come back and do some other short videos just kind of showing the progress of it. It's gonna be slow and steady. You know, I, I'm a lot busier now, and I just can only put a couple hours a day or so into playing. Um, I might be able to get a little more early on because I do give my wife a heads up, uh, and she's very, she's very helpful in terms of kind of facilitating me getting a little extra time on leak releases and stuff, which is great. Um, but I'll try to come back and give some updates. But hopefully, this. Uh, you know, potentially gives another option in the already bloated pool of great leak starter options. Until next time, see you guys.